Rhonda Patrick was on Joe Rogan's podcast. There was some interesting stuff that made it into these clips that floated around YouTube. And unfortunately, these clips leave a lot to be desired. She touches on some things and it gets us excited about using Asana, but it doesn't really give us the exquisite detail that we need. So the purpose of this video is not to bash or do anything. It's to expand upon some already amazing things that Rhonda touched on. I really like Rhonda Patrick. I think she does a lot of amazing work. So there's nothing but positive vibes and words towards her. So this is just to expand on that detail. So let's go ahead and dive into the true undoubted benefits of a sauna. After today's video, there is a link down below for Thrive Market. Now that is going to get you 30% off your entire grocery order. Okay, so if you are doing paleo, maybe you're doing keto, maybe you're intermittent fasting, you're trying different things out, Wish there were grocery stores that were dedicated for what kind of diet you were doing, right? Well, Thrive Market is like that. You just sort by whatever diet type you're doing and you can shop. It opens up a grocery store for you right there digitally for whatever diet you're doing, which is super cool. But the best part is using that link, you save 30% off your entire grocery order plus a $50 free gift because you're using that link through one of my videos. So check out Thrive Market after today's video to save some cash and get some awesome products. So on this JRE clip, it really highlights a lot of the decrease in all-cause mortality associated with sauna usage. Now, she doesn't get a chance to talk about the study itself. The study she's referring to is published in JAMA, and it's a pretty well-known study. It's probably one of the studies that's talked about the most in terms of sauna usage, and it takes a look at over the course of 21 years, looking at lots of different participants, how sauna usage correlates with all-cause mortality. Now with this study, they found that there was a 22% decreased risk in sudden cause of death with people that used a sauna two to three times per week compared to one time per week. Now with this, they also found that people that use a sauna two to three times per week had a 23% less chance of dying from a cardiovascular disease. But they found that people that sat in a sauna four to seven times per week, that risk decreased to 48%. So significantly less risk the more times you're sitting in a sauna. But with all-cause mortality, that's not just related to cardiovascular disease, two to three times per week, 24% less risk of all-cause mortality, four to seven times sitting in a sauna per week, 40% less risk in all-cause mortality. Okay, but what about sitting in a sauna for a longer period of time? See, that's what we don't get a chance to hear in this clip. If you sit in a sauna for longer, even with less frequency, you can still get similar benefits. So what this study demonstrated was that subjects that sat in a sauna for 11 to 19 minutes compared to less than 11 minutes had a 7% less risk of all-cause mortality. Okay, now increase that. People that sat in a sauna for 19 minutes or longer had a 52% less risk in all-cause mortality. So the length and time, it looks like sitting in a sauna for 19 minutes might be where you want to go, 19 plus. Now we need to talk heat shock proteins, okay? Because she talks about this towards the latter part of the video, but this is the good stuff. This is the part that I'm really into and where I think you really need to listen. So she talks a little bit about how they're what are called chaperone proteins and how they help with protein folding and cell structure. But really what's happening here is when you're exposed to high heat or you're exposed to any kind of like real stress, like hypoxia from extreme exercise or even altitude or nutrient scarcity with fasting or serious caloric restriction, or of course heat stress or even cold stress, you have increases in these chaperone proteins. Now, at rest, in a normal situation, we have a basal level of heat shock proteins. That means like our cells are always going through like folding and unfolding of proteins. There's always like this restructuring. And when we get exposed to different stressors, it speeds up the rate at which they're, they're going through these changes, okay? So when we are under stress, our body produces these chaperone proteins. And just like the name implies, they hold the hand of the protein, they chaperone them, they say, hey, we wanna make sure that you fold and unfold and go through your structural changes properly. Because without heat shock proteins, they would misfold and everything would be really wacky and the cell might ultimately die. So whenever the environment changes, it sort of triggers this. And heat, just like the name implies, heat shock protein, is probably the biggest driver of this. There was a study that was published that showed that sitting in a sauna for 30 minutes at 163 degrees, which is not very hot, to be honest, increased heat shock protein 72, HSP 72, by 
Okay, that is a huge increase in heat shock proteins for really not a lot of heat. So if you're sitting in a sauna that is hotter and for longer, you could arguably get even more of this. Now, if you don't have a sauna, there was a study that was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology that took a look at subjects that were exercising in the heat. In this case, it was like 108 degrees, so it's hot. So I don't necessarily think you should go out and do that immediately. But if you're exercising in the heat, they noticed that on a 10-day stint of continually exercising in the heat, heat shock protein 72 increased continually each day. So it didn't just occur in the beginning it continued to stack up on top of each other, meaning the acclimation continues to get better and better. I'm sure there is a line of diminishing return at some point, but it tells you that you're going to acclimate even more and get better. It's not like you get a big benefit from the beginning of a sauna, like newbie gains, and then it goes away. It actually gets better and better and better, probably, arguably, up to a certain point. Now, unfortunately, she doesn't get to talk about one of the most important things, and she's mentioned this in other clips before, but not on this one. It's so important. It's something about FOXO3, F-O-X-O-3. FOXO3 is what is called a transcription factor, which means it helps regulate genes and kind of corral genes in the right way. Now, in this particular case, the FOX group of transcription factors really regulate genes that have to do with uh, sort of like DNA damage, lipid peroxidation, stem cell breakdown, things like that. So really associated with longevity and aging. Now, FOXO3 is very much so sort of the resiliency one. It is associated with stressors and adapting to a stressor. So cold exposure, uh, extreme exercise, heat, things like that. What happens is FOXO3 forms a complex with what is called sirtuin-1, which people are now familiar with sirtuin-1 because Dr. David Sinclair talks so much about them. But anyway, it forms this complex with sirtuins. And essentially the sirtuins make FOXO3 much more geared towards helping a cell become resilient. Now what do I mean by this? Ordinarily, FOXO3's job is to help a cell sort of die. Its energy is really directed towards cell apoptosis, meaning like if a cell's not doing good, it needs to die. It's just like focused on that, okay? But under stress, it changes. When it's under stress and it's formed a bond with sirtuins, it changes its focus towards resilience. So instead of being pessimistic and wanting to kill cells all the time, it shifts gears and says, I'm gonna make these cells stronger. And this only happens when there is a stressor to trigger it. Now there's another transcription factor called NRF2. So when you sit in a sauna, you increase these transcription factors. Now NRF2 is largely associated with antioxidants, anti-inflammatory effects, really you know, combating oxidative stressors within the body. When you sit in a sauna, it increases something that is called hemoxygenase, which breaks down heme, which is something that would be a stressor and a powerful oxidant. It breaks it down into something more benign called carbon monoxide, which can actually be an anti-inflammatory as well. And then it also breaks it down into bilirubin. So much more benign things in the body that aren't powerful oxidants. So NRF2 upregulating, basically the body, when you sit in a sauna, it ends up making it so that the body has more ability to deal with these oxidants, reactive oxygen species. All of these have a very strong correlation with cardiovascular disease risk. So when we can upregulate NRF2, we see line item correlations with genes that are associated with better cardiovascular health and overall outcomes. Now, as an exercise mimicker, this is touched on a tiny bit and kind of alluded to, but I wish this was what they focused on because everyone's looking for a hack, right? Sitting in a high heat sauna might give you the same benefits as aerobic exercise. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure increases, you get similar endorphin response, similar obvious heat shock protein responses, but there's a study that was published in the Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports, and this is really interesting. They found that 30 minutes in a sauna, two times a week for three weeks, led to significant improvements in time to exhaustion. In this case, there was a 32% increase in time to exhaustion. They went 32% further with a 7.5% increase in blood plasma volume and a 3.5% increase in red blood cells. So you combine increase in red blood cells with more plasma volume, with more blood flow, you're delivering more oxygen. It makes sense that you would see a 32% improvement. That is wild, wild stuff. It really is an exercise mimicker. The only thing that's missing is you're not actually moving the body, right? So I'm sure that plays a role. There was also a study that took a look at heat acclimation and it found that as people got more acclimated to heat, whether from sauna or exercising in heat, it actually decreased the amount of glycogen that was needed by 40%. So basically, because there's more blood flow going to a muscle, 
you're able to grab more glucose out of the muscle, out of the muscle glycogen, without having to dump all of it in. It became more sparing and more efficient at the glucose it pulled out, which spares glycogen, which means that you can go further, longer, faster, and harder because you're sparing your glycogen rather than just dumping it all out and exhausting it. You've become more efficient because of that blood flow and therefore you're more stable with how you pull glucose out of the cell or out of the tissue in this case. And this is just a brief breakdown. We can go deeper and deeper and deeper into the benefits of utilizing Asana. And I just wanted to do everyone a service by expanding on what is already a great six minute clip. I'll see you tomorrow.